Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, as usual, since this is one of the last few talks of the workshop, I'd like to, to thank the organizers for this wonderful workshop so far, for letting me this opportunity to talk here, and um, all the speakers so far, because all the talks I think have been fantastic so far. Um, I wonder if mine will be up to the task. Let's see about that. So I'm going to present this, this article that is a um, um, recent preprint that we just published on the archive. It's a joint work with David Martinez Rubio from Oxford and Sebastian Pocuta from Zip. Um, let's, let's go think a bit about it. So as the title suggests, um, I'm going to talk about two related but very independent problems, you could say. Uh, one is the fairness, uh, packing proportional fairness or the one fair packing problem. And the other is the dual. And we are going to use different techniques for both, but they are related because they are one the dual of the other. So what is alpha fairness? Let's say that you have a function that um, you have a resource allocation problem among n users, and you want to maximize the happiness or the utility that each user gets from, from the resource. So this F means uh, how happy is the, the user, each user, if you allocate to, to them uh, X sub i resources. So if your F were the identity, um, you would have that um, this would be just, well, optimizing a linear program, right? Because this is maximizing the sum of, of the X sub i. If your x were the, the log, for example, this is a utility function that appears um, a lot in, in economics, actually, because it's um, a utility function that more or less models how humans behave about money. We are more or less happy in proportion to the log of the money that we have. Um, but in particular, let's talk about something that is called alpha fair utilities. An alpha fair utility is a case that generalizes these two examples that I just said. Um, the alpha fair utility of X is, well, if alpha equals one, then it's just the logarithm of, of X. And if alpha is, is not one, but it's positive, then it's, it's X to the one minus alpha divided by, by one minus alpha. So in particular, if alpha equals zero, then you have uh, just a linear program. If alpha equals one, then you have this log utility. And this case of alpha equals one is particularly interesting because, well, because first of all, this thing that I already said, that it's a utility that models how, how humans uh, behave. It also, it's interesting because it's under certain axiomatic assumptions. It's the most fair subdivision that you could do. Um, but in particular for us, it's, it's interesting because, um, because we have an algorithm that optimizes the packing problems with this utility. Let's see what, what is exactly the problem we want to, th to think about. So you have a positive matrix and you want to maximize um, over the positive reals. Your, your utility function that I just defined. So this is for alpha equals one, as, as you may remember. Um, you want to optimize this over this feasible region that is a positive polytope. So it's uh, all the rows are positive. If you draw this, it's like this. So it's the positive orthant and all the rows are pointing towards the positive orthant. This is your polytope. Note that here I could draw a B, but since all the rows are positive, um, there is no reason to, to consider the negative B case or the zero case, B case. So you, you might just divide every row by the corresponding B sub i, and you have a one in the, in the right-hand side. And this is important because we are going to think about the, um, a hyperplane. Let's say, that you, let's say that you have this hyperplane, this um, constraint. Well, you could think of this as just this point, right? As just the first n coordinates, because you know that the last one will be one. And that makes duality a bit easier to, to think about. So let's think about this. Let's talk about these previous results for the one fair packing problem. So, um, this, as you can see, ours for the one fair packing problem is the, the fastest so far, because um, this one is, was the fastest until now, and this was for uh, the general alpha case. And we can exploit the special geometry that alpha equals zero has. Um, and note that it's also the first one that is really width independent. With the width here is the maximum of the AIJ divided by the minimum of the AIJ. Um, yeah. So our algorithm is not only the fastest, but the, the only one that is width independent. And um, this row is the width in particular. Um, yep. And we have both an algorithm from the primal and an algorithm for the dual. Let's talk about the primal first. Um, actually, most of the talk will be focused on the dual because I think it's more in, more in tune with the, the topic of the workshop, but I cannot just ignore the primal. So what, what did, we do, did we do with the dual the primal problem? Um, so we basically combine techniques from two articles, from uh, both from the from Moreki actually. Uh, one is the reparameterization for the alpha fair packing case um, and the barrier function that they use. 
And the other is the linear coupling technique that they use for the zero packing or the packing LP, if you prefer. Okay. Um, what is this reparameterization and barrier function? Well, let me explain. So basically, instead of, of using the, the xi's as we did before, we have replaced them by exponentials. And this means that instead of taking logs here, we, we have just the sum of the, of the variables. So this is just a change of variables. This, we didn't change the problem. What we did here is that um, the objective function is simpler to understand at the cost of the constraints being harder. Um, however, we are not going to really optimize this problem. We are going to work on the regularized problem, which is now a minimization problem. So now that we changed the same design here, and now we added something. And this something is our barrier function. So as beta is, is small, uh, this is not a beta, this is a beta. As beta is small, um, then you can see that this exponent here will be, will be large. And therefore, the, this will um, not blow up, but, but grow very, very quickly once you are outside of the matrix, right? Because then these things will be, one of them will be larger than one. Therefore, the sum will be uh, very large. So if you take beta as, as this technical thing, this is the barrier function that we're going to optimize. And suddenly, this problem is a, an unrestricted problem for which there there are nice techniques that we can use, in particular this linear coupling technique that I will explain in a minute. But let's, um, I want to show you that this is not the, the log barrier function hidden in a clever way, first of all, because in the log barrier function, um, what you have is an explosion near the boundary, right? But here, however, um, it's, it's never exposed. It just grows very quickly. Here in the, in the left side, we have the, the, the barrier function. Well, the, actually we have the regularized objective where the, the color represents the magnitude. And as you can see, um, well, the minimum is in this area here. Um, this is like the, the basin, you could say. It's since we don't have this property like with the log barrier function that it explodes outside of, of the polytope. Uh, it's not obvious a priori that the, the optimum of the regularized problem will be inside this polytope, right? Uh, so this is something that we will have to prove. And um, here we have the, the gradient of the, of the um, function. And here the color represents the, the magnitude of the gradient. You can see that the gradient is large when the function is large. And this is, this is important. And um, yeah. And one more thing that I would like to say is that the smoothness of this, this function um, well, this function in general is not smooth because as you go farther and farther away, the gradient uh, grows very, very quickly. But you can, and we bound this problem to a certain box that is a technical constraint. And within this box, we can bound the, we can bound the, um, the smoothness constraints. And the smoothness measures how fast the gradient changes. So now let's, this is our function. And now let's talk in one slide what linear coupling is. I don't want to get into the, into the first order method rabbit hole. But let's talk about this because I think it's really, 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 really interesting. Um, so first of all, we have gradient descent. Uh, we all know gradient descent. Gradient descent is, uh, well, you have your convex function that you want to minimize. Um, this, let's say that you are at this point right now. So this is your gradient, right? If you know that your function is smooth, did you know that the gradient will not change very quickly? And that tells you that your function lives below certain paraboloids. So now if you take as your next point, the vertex of this parabola, you know that uh, you have some decrease in your object objective function that is proportional to the magnitude of the gradient. Okay, this is gradient descent. Now let's talk about mirror descent. Mirror descent is a um, very different approach actually, but it's also very nice. So let's say that so far you have visited these points and now you are here, you are here. Um, so far uh, the gradients, give you, since this is convex, all the gradients give you some lower bound over of the function. So in particular, the average of these gradients is also some lower bound of function. You could, it would be nice to minimize, to take as your next point, the minimizer of this lower function. But then uh, since this is unbounded, this could be very bad and it could be very unstable. So instead, let's, let's minimize the, um, the minimum lower bound, the minimum lower bound that you can find plus some regularized objective that usually is the distance to your previous point. And if you do that, then you have that uh, this, this, instead of giving you a guarantee on the primal progress, it gives you a guarantee on, on the dual progress. So it gives you a guarantee on how far the lower bound is. And now we have linear coupling. In linear coupling, uh, this is mirror descent. Mirror descent. 
So in, in linear coupling or accelerating methods, um, you combine both. This is why it's called coupling. So you are going to start at certain point xk, and now you are you do one iteration of, of the primal of the gradient descent case. You do one iteration of the of the mirror descent case, and this is going to give you some set k. And now you interpolate this to modulo some tau, and this is going to be your next xk plus one point. And the beautiful thing about this is that if you do the analysis carefully, you can guarantee that either your new point will do a lot of a primal improvement, so it's more like gradient descent or it will do a lot of dual improvement and it's more like mirror descent. And this gives you something that is faster, it gives faster convergence rates than either of these two methods, uh, which is really, really cool, I think. Um, so we apply this technique to this, to this problem that I explained before, and we get this theorem. Let's go through it a little bit. Um, if epsilon is your, your um, accuracy parameter, this is a technical con constraint, of course. Uh, let's say that X star is the optimum of the primal problem, uh, the original primal problem. And let's say that you compute um, over the regularized problem uh, point in the box, such that it's not too far in the regularized problem to the optimum of the regularized problem. Um, then our algorithm computes such a point in, in just O, uh, this tilde here means a log. There is a log involved, but it's roughly like O of N of, uh, divided by epsilon, where epsilon is this accuracy parameter, remember? iterations and um, yeah and besides if you undo the change of variables and you take this x x hat which is the, the solution uh, with by uh, undoing the change of variables <laughs> uh, then this this point is a physical point of the of the original primal problem and it's not too far from the optimal of the original primal problem it's just within an o of epsilon so it's very nice this is how how we managed to to solve it in just this many iterations now let's forget about everything I just said because I'm going to talk about the dual problem. So this two, this is the, our primal dual pair. This is this first problem is the problem that we just talked about: uh, positive constraints, maximizing the sum of the logarithms in some positive polytope. Um, you could think of this like, well, you have your positive polytope and you want to maximize the product of the coordinates, right? This is exactly the same thing, modulo certain constant or something. And now what is the dual problem? Well, the dual problem, this is the Lagrangian duality. Uh, the dual problem corresponds to, you take the um, a convex combinations of these constraints, will be, which will be some constraint that is feasible over P. And you want to find the one that minimizes the volume of this simplex that is restricted, the, the area between the, the simplex and the, and the first orphan. And this is what this, this uh, function here means in, in geometric terms. And the thing that is interesting about this pair is that if you look at the, the dual solution and the primal solution in the same picture, you will have that, um, um, let's say that X star is the primal solution and y, y star is the dual solution. You will have that X star is exactly the centroid of the simplex formed by this hyperplane intersected with, um, with the first orthon. Um, this motivates something that we call the centroid map. So the centroid map is that if you have a hyperplane, remember that here, this hyperplane represents X times that less than one. Um, it's always a one, so we don't need the, the independent term. Then the centroid is one divided by N um, and the inverses of the coordinates. So for example, in 3D, this is like, well, this is your hyperplane. And now the centroid will be the body center of, of this simplex. And what we want to do is that, well, remember that we said this thing about the, about the primal dual pair being exactly one centroid of the other. We want to find some, some uh, constraint such that its centroid is close to the polytope. Uh, close, you could say, in terms of the Minkowski norm of this, of this uh, polytope. Um, let's do some quick definitions, first of all. So the um, I have used this plenty of times already. P is your positive polytope. D is the convex hull of the rows of your, of your matrix. So in dual space, this will be like certain things like this, I don't know. Um, but D is not necessarily the set of all the physical constraints in your polytope. This is going to be D plus. This D plus will be the convex hull of, of the rows plus the minus uh, positive orthant or plus the negative orthant. And then you intersect it with the positive orphan. This is a bit weird, but um, I will show it in an interactive picture in a minute. So bear with me, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to minimize the, the, the hyperplane 
we are going to find the hyperplane that minimizes how far is the centroid to P. Or in other words, we're going to find a point that is a centroid of something that is feasible. And we're going to minimize the distance to P. This is like the Minkowski norm of, Minkowski norm of, of P. Um, P. So let's go to GeoGebra because I think this was a bit dense. And I have prepared a couple of nice pictures here. So here is this on the left, you can see D plus and B. You can see that B is a subset of D plus and it's just uh, the result of uh, adding the, um, the negative uh, coordinate vectors. And um, here in the dual picture, you can see that the, this is just the image via the centroid map. Uh, you can see that D, the centroid of D is not convex. This is this dark blue region, but the centroid of D plus is convex. Um, the intersection is exactly one point always, and this is going to be our solution. And um, if the if P is smooth in certain area, then then D becomes uh, the centroid of D becomes pointy. And if I make P pointy, then the centroid of, of D becomes smooth. So there is always like it's never a bad problem. This is what is very very nice about this picture. You can see that there is always there's never like a degree two tangency between these two things. And the question that now um, is left is that, well, if we will have an algorithm that solves linear feasibility problems, um, positive linear feasibility problems under uh, a certain convex subset in which in our case will be C D plus, then we could solve this problem, right? Because this is just the problem of finding a, a point that is both in C of D plus and in P. Uh, good. Good, so this is what we, we are going to do. What is a packing linear feasibility problem? Well, this is a typo, so no, don't look at it. A packing linear feasibility problem is, is there a certain X in your convex set, convex positive set, such that it satisfies all, all um, it's also in this polytope. And there is a very nice algorithm for solving this kind of, of uh, problems, which is Lotkin's moist Tardos. And well, this is actually our version of, of PST because <laughs> we needed to, to adapt it to our, to our properties. So if sigma and tau are so two width parameters, we call them, uh, that are positive, and then epsilon is technical thing, then uh, if you have an oracle that given a convex combination of the rows of A, it returns a point that in the convex set such that, let's look at this one first, it's below your, your convex combination of the rows and uh, the, um, the slacks of, of A are not too bad. Like they are between minus tau and sigma. So in graphical terms, you have this P and now you have your convex combination of the, of the rows, which is going to be this. This is going to be your lambda transpose A. Now your, your oracle will return a point below this lambda transpose A. And not only that, but it's going to be in between um, these two things, you could say it's, well, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be between these two things. Like for every hyperplane, it's going to be uh, in between the plus, the one plus sigma and the one minus tau um, values for that hyperplane. So it's not too far to the, to the one value. This is what we want to say. Well, if you have this Oracle, then the PST algorithm returns an epsilon approximate solution in just sigma tau divided by epsilon square log something iterations. So this is what we are going to use, this particular version of PST that has different sigma and tau. So the key idea here is um, what is this oracle, right? The oracle will determine your complexity because the oracle determines their sigma and your tau. So our key idea is that good solutions to this dual proxy problem, remember that the dual proxy problem is this problem of finding some uh, constraint whose center it is, is near P. Uh, if you have some good solution to this dual proxy problem, then uh, it is easy to, it gives you a bounce on where the optimum may be. Because if your hyperplane is uh, in C of D, uh, this is, this is a, a mistake. If your hyperplane is feasible, then in particular it's feasible over all of P and in particular it's feasible over X star. So that tells you that if you have some feasible solution, the, the optimum is going to be below it, right? On the other hand, if you're, again, this is uh, the same typo. If your point, if your hyperplane is an epsilon approximate solution, it means that um, 
well, it's centroid is it's uh, close to to p. In other words, if you project the centroid and you get this p point, um, well, then the the optimum dual solution has to be feasible over this point, and in particular, so some hyperplane like this will not do it because it's not feasible over here. If you draw the locus of all the points that are centroids of of constraints that are feasible in V, you have something that looks like this. And as you make your, your solution closer and closer to the optimum, this region in between becomes smaller and smaller. And we call this the lens of H because it looks a bit like a, a planar biconcave or something lens. Um, and as you get smaller and smaller, it will get smaller and smaller around the center. So let's look at it in the interactive setting again, if you don't mind. So here we have, um, I'm dragging around the, the centroid here. You can see that the, the centroid is it's always the, the midpoint of this segment. Um, if I make, if I drag the centroid in such a way that this is no longer feasible over P, you can see that I'm outside of the blue zone and suddenly I'm intersecting the red zone. Um, and then the, oh, I, I lost the, the curve. Um, I don't know what happened, but yeah, you should have seen. Uh, yeah, this is what I wanted. So this is going to be the, the lens of, of, the, um, of the optimum. As you make this closer and closer to the intersection, you can see that this lens becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until it converges to a point. So what our Oracle will do is we, we will compute a point that is guaranteed to be in this shaded area. And if it's in this shaded area and your solution is good, then the point that you are returning is close to the boundary. So your Oracle is good. Um, I hope this makes it a little easier. Good. So what are we going to do? Uh, we start with some delta approximate solution. So this is um, some hyperplane that such that the centroid is within a one plus delta of the of P. And then we are going to use PST and the Oracle that the previous solution provided to get a delta half approximate solution. And we have and half and half again until we, until, um, we have a, a solution that is smaller than, it's ever smaller than epsilon. And with this way, you get to theorem nine. If your accuracy parameter is uh, within technical limits, uh, then there is this algorithm that finds your linear combination of the rows or this feasible uh, hyperplane um, such that uh, the centroid is um, at most uh, one epsilon away from P is what I want to say here after O of N squared divided by epsilon iterations. But this solves the proxy problem. But um, however, this same solution is also an epsilon divided by n approximate solution of the original dual problem. So this means that the, indeed, if something is close to, if some constraint has its center close to the, to the polytope, it means that the constraint is also close to being an optimum of the dual problem. So finally, let's, let's talk about why, what is our motivation for all of this and why we think this is interesting. So there's this linear programming algorithm that is one of the really earliest algorithms. It's actually earlier than the ellipsoid method. Um, it looks a lot like the ellipsoid method. And it's very surprising. And it works in the following way. It's for linear feasibility in general. Let's say that you want to determine if your polytope P is empty or not. And you know that this polytope is within some simplex. Uh, you can start this initial simplex um, in such a way. I mean, it's, it's possible to do it. It's just that the size will depend on, on the bit complexity of your polytope. Now let's look at the centroid of your simplex. If the centroid is in P, then you won't. You have your, your primal certificate. If your centroid is not in P, then there must be some hyperplane such that separates P from, from your centroid. And assume that you have such an oracle. In the case of a, of a polyhedron, that's very easy, right? Then, uh, well, you can compute on a new simplex. It's a lot like the ellipsoid method. You can compute a new simplex that what you can guarantee is that the new simplex has smaller volume. It's an, not strictly smaller volume than the original. Um, actually, it's, it's smaller than the volume plus times a constant, so that you can guarantee that first convergence and stuff. Um, well, the, this Jaminski Levin algorithm says nothing about, it's just optimizing one hyperplane at a time, right? So it would be nice if we could optimize all of them at, a, at the same time, or at least all of the ones that are um, pointing in the opposite direction of a fixed vertex. So the ones such as the normal is minimizing this vertex. If you fix this some modulo some um, affine transformation, so that this is the first orthon, 
then this is exactly the problem we have been working on, right? You have your polytope P, that is all the constraints are positive, and then now you want to find some hyperplane such that this simplex has small volume. So we believe that if we run Jamnitsky Levin in this, but using our dual algorithm, uh, it should be fast. However, we don't know exactly if it's faster or not. <laughs> so this is something that we want to do. <laughs> um, finally, I would like to mention some selective bibliography. First of all, this is our nice archive article in case you want to check it out. Now there's the Allen 2 Orecchia article. This is for the zero fair packing problem. This is a, also a really, really nice article because this is incredibly fast for this particular class of, of linear programs. Um, then this one is for the alpha fair case, which is the one where we got the, the reparameterization from. Finally, this, this one here is wh where we got our particular variant of, of PST that we had to modify still. And as a final word, I would like to thank um, Elias Kutsupias because um, this idea of, of thinking of Jamnitsky Levin in terms of a packing problem was originally his. <laughs> um, so this is everything I have. So if you have any questions. Thank you very much.